All right. So my name is Magnus. I'm, in, I'm a Swedish security researcher, which also means English is in my native tongue, so please bear with me. Um, <clears throat> so this is about an, an, an on anonymity protocol or an, an anonymity project that I've been looking at. And uh, a little bit background first. Uh, why is this interesting? Uh, the last few years, the, we've seen a big upswing in uh, anti-online privacy measures of different kinds. Like a lot, uh, big force behind it is, of course, a huge press pressure from media companies, uh, which have result and other things, of course, but which have resulted in, for example, private organizations tracking users and sites by miscellaneous illegal means. ISPs tracking and throttling arbitrary traffic, both for, for these re media company reasons and uh, commercial reasons as a by, by effect. Data retention laws in uh, Europe and uh, other parts of the world. Wiretapping laws in Sweden and uh, in the US too. The, for example, the FISA recent uh, law proposal or whatever. Uh, other draconian laws for tracking and punishing peer-to-peer -peer users, like the, the Act the Trade Agreement proposal and uh, French, a French law proposal f proposing to, to starting to ban peer-to-peer -peer users uh, if uh, being caught sharing files three times, they will be banned for one year or three years or something from the internet. Uh, ISPs are starting to, to be forced to police the traffic of the users, have to take responsibility for what the users are, are doing, which is of course hard and quite impossible. It's blacklists of different kinds, the, you, you often, they often use child porn as, a, as some kind of excuse, but, but these blacklists have already been abused for other, other kinds of things. One quite funny example is there was this uh, Finnish uh, EFF activist who criticized, exposed and criticized these uh, blacklists they had in, in Finland uh, that were, uh, they had the excuse, it's, well, it said child porn blacklist, so the ISPs na nationwide just blocked some IP addresses. So we put up a website with criticism against this and his website was put into this blacklist, which was of course quite ironic. Uh, and uh, also the US, uh, new US ISPs recently have started to, to block or, or stop their users from, from getting any access to news groups at all with, with the excuse of there could be child porn on them, but so we, let's block them all. But of course there are other, other forces on behind that, other IDs behind that. Uh, and uh, then, of course, dictatorships and other regimes uh, oppressing their people, blocking them, s tracking them, punishing them for, for viewing the wrong websites. And also, there's even a, a recent e European law proposal that, to, to, that you should not be able to have your own blog unless you're registered by name and address and uh, so that everyone can can uh, track the opinions of everyone writing anything on the internet and make sure that they're not writing anything wrong. So, th so th there's a lot of things, anti-online privacy-wise. So, so because of this, I'm, I'm quite surprised that there haven't been any bigger adoption of uh, uh, an an anonymity uh, protocols, anonymity, anonymity solutions used by everyone. Sure, we have Tor, and it's it's a great protocol, uh, but but it's not like everyone's using it. Li like uh, for for file sharing, we have de facto standards like BitTorrent, and uh, so if you go, were you going to download a big file or share a big file, that's BitTorrent. But but for anonymity, not not so many people know about this or, or use it. All, in spite of all these all these anti -onli online privacy measures. Uh, and also these, these existing uh, solutions, they, they in, in some ways or in quite a few ways are, are not well suited for, for some of today's and uh, the future's uh, demand for anonymization and the circumstances surrounding it. While at the same time they are of course really good in, in many ways. Uh, so uh, I thought, well if no one else is doing it, why not uh, sit down and think about this for a while. The, uh, a new, new an anonymization standard, uh, de facto standard uh, that, that everyone can use for, for, for most things, which, which uh, will s hopefully solve some of the shortcomings or, or uh, 
yeah, the sh shortcomings of, of the of the current solutions uh, in in view of, of current uh, circumstances. And that's that's how this project started. Uh, so what are the goals of the project then? Uh, I want it to be some kind of good reference uh, for future work within the field of anonymization so, so that others can build upon it. I want to start this kind of work for this idea and then hopefully it'll grow and be some kind of inspiration for, for uh, further discussion about what are the optimal requirements for, for a protocol like this, a future anonymization solution like this. Uh, and of course also to be some kind of starting point and uh, inspiration for, for the actual design and development of a global a project that like this, a global de facto standard for decentralized generic anonymization. What it is not, uh, at this point anyway, uh, is a, c a complete detailed specification ready to be implemented. It's rather something, some ideas, some designs uh, to, to be built upon, discussed and refined into something of this, this sort. So some technical limitations or one central technical limi limitation of this is that uh, the protocol, like most other anonymization protocols, uh, really don't work or aren't designed to work if there, there's an attacker uh, controlling uh, all, controlling or rather, rather eavesdropping all network traffic from all nodes in, in the certain network that you are trying to anonymize yourself in. Uh, it should be noted though that such an attacker will of course never be able to see what the different nodes are talking about, only perhaps in, under these extreme conditions, who they are t communicating with. Uh, yeah, and of course, the, the protocol contains uh, countermeasures uh, in order to, to counter or decrease the probability that, that an, any attacker should be able to, to uh, eavesdrop many nodes. Some other assumptions and directives are that uh, ar arbitrary peers in the network uh, are, of course, assumed to be compromised and or adverse because this is a decentralized network. Everyone else is just, no one is more central or more known to the project than you, you yourself if you're joining. So of course they could be bad and try to break things. And uh, also one important directive during, during the development of this is that CPU power, network bandwidth, working memory, secondary storage resources, all computer resources practically, are relatively cheap and uh, will of course be available in ever increasing quantity now and even more during coming years. So wherever there, have, there has been a choice of, of a stronger anonymity, stronger security or, or more uh, throughput or lower resource con consumption, uh, the, the, uh, the security has always been put in first place. So some limitations of this presentation. It's only an overview, overview some, something to, to get, you, get you the starting details about what this is and to, uh, there then so that you should be interested more in the white paper and also to discuss things with me or on the project website, which you will see later. But the, wi the white paper can be downloaded immediately if you want to take a closer look. Uh, so uh, let's start with some of the design goals set for this project. Uh, what I wanted to do, when I started this, I thought like, I'm gonna sit down and think really good from the start, from the very, very, uh, yeah, the design goal, goal level. Uh, what, what, what are the requirements of this protocol to make it good uh, in, in today's, today, today's world? Uh, yes, uh, today and the future. So I came up with eight primary uh, design goals, which they're in the list here, but I'm gonna go through them one by one in the following slides. So the first the design goal is complete decentralization. Uh, no central or weak points can exist in a network like this because there will be people who, who don't want su such a solution as this to, to exist. So people will work against it, both legally and technically, they will try to sue the people running it at some point, just like most, uh, most similar, similar solutions have ended or been attacked uh, so far. And uh, if that won't work, there will be technical attacks of different kinds, practically DOS attacks or takedowns of servers and things like that. So it's, it's very important that there are no central servers, no central point that you can attack in order to bring down the whole solution or the whole network. 
uh, the, the, so both ownership b to protect from legal legal attacks and uh, the technical design to protect from technical attacks uh, must be decentralized, which means open s open source, open open design, community owned uh, project, uh, and a technically decentralized solution. Uh, design goal number two: maximum dust resistance. As mentioned in the last slide, the if if you decentralize it like this. The practically only way to stop it will be to dust the network, find technical flaws in it, and, and exploit them in order to mess it up, bring it, bring 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 down the network, and uh, make it unuseful, uh, unusable. Uh, and as usual, it only takes one weakness uh, at some point of the protocol uh, to to bring it down. So defensive thinking throughout the design process is very important, and the implementation process. Uh, design goal number three, theoretically secure anonymization, which practically means no security by obscurity, n no leaving thi uh, anything to chance, thinking, oh, they wouldn't do that. It's, that would take too much resources or time. Uh, so rather, all the anonymization aspects, uh, I think, should be able to, to be expressed either as a risk probability uh, based on n known probabilities, like how many nodes in the network, if 90% of the nodes in the network are uh, controlled by an attacker, then the, the probability to be exposed is, uh, is this and that and uh, such things. And also cryptographic proofs, like if the RSA algorithm is broken, this, this will fail too. But if it's not broken, this should be secure, this part. Uh, design goal number four, uh, secure and theoretically secure end-to-end -end encryption. Quite, quite a elementary thing in t today's internet, uh, but but still very important because confidentiality is not only important in itself, but only but also important for anonymi for anonymity. Because if if a connection is eavesdropped for for uh, enough time, it's highly likely that some sorts of identifi identifying information will be sent over it. So so confidentiality confidentiality is directly important to an anonymity too. Uh, so, so which means that even if someone would monitor and correlate all traffic in the network uh, with the current design, they will not be able to extract any of the communicated information in it. It will only be viewable to the to the exact communicating endpoints, just like with SSL or something like this. But this is bounced around a bit first. So another one, more interesting one, is isolation from the normal internet. And by normal internet, I mean like the normal IP space. You shouldn't be able to say with Tor, for example, you can say I want to be, I want to contact this and that IP address on that port, and I want to be anonymous. This will, of course, result in the final final node, the exit node, or the out proxy. Uh, that connections can be track traced back to this one, and he can get in trouble if someone hacked a government computer from his. Uh, from from with him as the last uh, node uh, in going through Tor, for example, which would of course uh, make people less uh, likely uh, to to want to use such a solution. So uh, I, I I rather wanted to make it isolate an isolated network where only all the people who joins the, they can they can decide that we want to be anonymous towards each other. But for that sake, no one should be able to use this network to go to go out to any other. Uh, node on the internet, IP address on the internet, who has not agreed to be to be part of uh, the uh, the anonymity solution. Uh, so uh, it actually has qu quite a lot of advantages like this, but not so many disadvantages when you come to think about it. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, out proxies or or exit nodes towards the normal internet could still easily be implemented at the application level. Uh, for example. Uh, Sox proxy connected to this or, or something like that. So no, no big deal at all. It's just not in the protocol li like Tor. Uh, design goal number six, uh, protection against protocol identification. Mm, uh, there will, as I mentioned before, prob probably be a, a lot of uh, powerful interests of different kinds who, who want to see such a solution stopped. Uh, and uh, this can result in laws that force ISPs to, to block it or, or, or disable it or uh, throttle it or uh, something like that, uh, w which they are already today doing with some other uh, protocols that are not very liked by, by certain uh, organizations. Uh, so the harder y it is you make it to, to positively identify that you're using it at all, 
the harder it will of course be to, to track, throttle and block it. So that's one of the major design goals. Cycle number seven, high volume uh, and throughput capacity. With, with existing solutions like uh, Tor, this is a big uh, problem. You are practically not allowed to, to, to send larger amounts of uh, data through it. And uh, in today's uh, internet uh, world, uh, even larger volumes are required for normal internet use each day, like just viewing YouTube movies uh, for a few minutes could could uh, consume hundreds of megabytes, which would be a problem through Tor. You can even be kicked from, from Tor uh, by, by it because you're breaking the, the rules. Uh, so, uh, yeah, more or less high speed and throughput is necessary for many internet applications uh, today. Uh, and uh, the popularity of a protocol like this will of course be, be, be proportionally related to the transfer speed and the throughput capacity of it. So, uh, otherwise the people who, who need more capacity, more speed, they won't be interested and they won't uh, join it or use it at all. And, because of, and since the anonymity of the protocol, as most other anonymity protocols, are directly related to the popularity of it, or rather to the number of people connected to the solution that data can be routed through, this is directly important to, to the anonymity of it too. Uh, yeah, design goal number eight, last one, a bit more loose. A generic, well abstracted and backward compatible, just a generic system, that which means generic and uh, that generic network traffic could be anonymized through it, not just, it's not l contrary to an uh, anonymized IRC client or anonymous uh, FTP client or something like this, it, it could anonymize generic network data. Uh, well, a well, well abstracted system and design will of course uh, allow for more efficient and distributed design and implementation in general, just common software development Uh, and uh, also, the, the backward compatible thing is quite important because uh, a system compatible with all pre -ex pre previously existing network uh, applications will of course get a much quicker takeoff and community penetration because everyone can just activate it for the, the, the programs they use every day and just the, the there will they will don't notice any difference except the uh, slowdown, relative slowdown, which we will of course try to minimize. Uh, but but I if, la as for some other uh, of these solutions, you have to compile special programs to be able to use it at all, or use SOX proxies, like in this case of uh, Tor many times, there will be much bigger threshold for people to, to start using it at all, which is, uh, again, uh, of course, critical to the, to the security of the protocol. So a small bird's eye view to start with uh, of the technology or the ID, general IDs. Not sure. Oh, yeah, can you see this? Yeah. So uh, on the internet today, like you have like two nodes out of many who want to communicate with each other. N they normally do like this, create direct connection to each other. This though does not only mean that they can send and receive data to and from each other, but they also automatically know the identity of each other with which in most cases isn't necessary at all for the, for the reasons that you are doing this communication. So that's a bad idea if you want to be anonymous. So the, the, the natural thing to do with any or most anonymization protocols is to bounce the data from through a set of different nodes so the data will still reach the, the nodes in the end but they will no longer know each other's identity automatically, implicitly. And in this case, you l and as with so many other uh, good protocols, uh, good uh, anonymization protocols, you do this by, by having paths w w which the different nodes will route their data through. In this particular case, the each node will be uh, responsible for creating their own paths. So alpha will create its path and uh, make it ready for communication. Beta will create its path and make it ready for communication. And if they want to speak to each other, the paths will be uh, interconnected and uh, data can then uh, flow through between alpha and beta. Uh, like any other connection, just with, with a few computers between instead of just a few routers. So these routing paths, uh, in order to, to, to make it more secure and more customizable, each, each of the nodes can, can, as mentioned before, build their own nodes, build their own routing paths, sorry. 
Uh, so if alpha is really paranoid, it could build a really long path. And if beta is less paranoid, he can build a shorter path. And they will still be able to just uh, interconnect them to be able to speak. B very basic, basic stuff. So a little more on high level design of this uh, protocol. You have these routing paths, which consist of uh, the anonymized node, uh, the interme uh, an intermediate node, and an arbitrarily more uh, inter intermediate nodes, uh, where the number is chosen by, by the anonymized node itself. And then, in the end, a terminating intermediate node, that's the exit node or entry node, the last intermediate node in the routing path. So then, something I call routing tunnels. That's, uh, that's something where all the anonymized nodes, they, they create a couple of these, uh, handful of these, these routing paths when, when just uh, connecting to the network, when they're starting their computer or whatever. It, it, takes, it could take uh, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, two minutes, it's a, it's a one it's a one time thing or or at least a uh, very rarely rare thing so it doesn't really matter that it takes uh, takes a bit of time but once those uh, routing paths are up and they want to make a connection to someone uh, that's when they create a routing tunnel inside the routing path and uh yeah and like i said and uh, it will just be a virtual connection practically or uh, inside th this uh, routing path uh, uh, and uh, the, the important thing is that it will be set up relatively quick over existing, uh, existing hops and existing TCP connections, not exclusively, but, but uh, anyway, uh, as we will see, uh, which will uh, then be connected to, to a routing tunnel in, in the receiving uh, routing path, the, the routing path of the receiving node, which will form a complete anonymized uh, connection. Uh, as you see there, the connection goes out from the, from the last the terminating intermediate node, and will be uh, connected to to the the incoming uh, routing tunnel of beta, and now we have a full anonymized connection. So then the concept of AP addresses, because uh, this protocol is is separate from the from the uh, normal internet, we have our own address space. It is very very similar to to the the address space of internet, though for a reason. Uh, so or even the name, AP address, IP address. This is called anonymous protocol addresses contrary to internet protocol addresses. They are equivalent to IP addresses in their format. Uh, they are equivalent to IP, IP addresses in their functionality, uh, except for one important thing, the main important thing, of course, that they, that they do not expose the, the identity of, uh, of the peers just because they can talk to each other. Uh, so the uh, the reason that that they are so similar is of course that uh, to make it easier to to make the protocol backward compatible with all IP applications that the IP applications will just think that they are using normal IP addresses, uh, but in reality they will be using AP addresses, but they w they won't be the wiser. So so in. Uh, T to make something like this work, a completely decentralized uh, solution, you would you would think that you would need some kind of central directory or or a central entity to to let the nodes be able to find each other and uh, interact. So so enter the network database. It's you you can compare to to the routing tables of the normal internet. It would someone would would state an AP address or you will have an AP address that they want to use and the uh, network database will contain the information that uh, will be needed to, to send the information to the, to the endpoint that they will, would like to reach. On the normal in internet, that would be bouncing through different routers. Uh, in this uh, protocol, it will be bouncing uh, between different, uh, different computers or nodes, very, very much similar to, to Tor, for example. Uh, this database uh, will be distributed and decentralized and uh, suggestively it would be based on distribute, uh, dis distributed hash table technology. Uh, this is a proven technology. It, it's used in uh, several large scale implementations like for example the, the CAD network uh, which is a Kademlia based distributed hash table network used in uh, EMU. Uh, the main thing is that there are no central central servers, no central anything. Only the nodes, but together they form the the equivalent of a centralized database, which people could execute queries against, and uh, just like a database. 
Uh, most of these pro distributed hash table technologies have uh, automatic resilience to constantly disappearing in newly joining nodes because people should be able to just connect to the network and then disconnect when they're finished and the integrity of the database should still be, be kept. And they also, many of them also has automatic and built-in resilience to some degree of, uh, for malicious nodes and th that's of course good. But as I mentioned, the network nodes are the database the network nodes joining the network. That is your computer, my computer, you're part of the network when, as soon as you connect. So a few more design details. And this is what, this is the most detailed part of the, part of the presentation. I'm not sure if, if you'll be able to, to, to grip everything right here and now, but it's just to, to, be, to be able to provide some kind of understanding what's going on. So you want, when you want to establish this, uh, the first, the initial routing paths, Alpha, we have here Alpha, he wants, he wants a routing path which he wants to be able to use to make outgoing and incoming uh, connections, uh, anonymous connections. So the first thing he does is uh, he chooses at, at random, he actually uses the, the network database to, to get a few samples of IP addresses which are also in the network. And this is IP addresses, like the IP addresses of your computer, my computer, who has also joined this network. Uh, this information in the database is, of course, completely decoupled from, from the AP address uh, information about nodes, which would otherwise compromise the entire meaning of this protocol. So he, ch he chooses uh, at random, uh, at his own will. Of, uh, he, he can pick these however he wants to. So if he gets a, a sample of 1,000 IP addresses from the, from the network database, he can, he can look like, okay, are, are these in the same CNET? Are these in the same VNet, ANet? Are they in of the, at the same ISP? Are they in the same country? Uh, and uh, by that, he can, he can select them in a, in a way which is as to make it a little as unprobable as possible that they would be controlled by the same attacker. Next, he chooses a bunch of more nodes in the exact same way, uh, which will be helper nodes only, uh, only uh, contributing to the setup process of the uh, path, but not later, but not in the actual path. The X nodes will c constitute the actual path. Uh, so he then orders these nodes in a sequence uh, according to certain rules, which we will see right in just in a few seconds. Like this, one, two, three, four, five, uh, up to eight. So the rules are that no two nodes, no two X nodes can be adjacent to each other. The X nodes are the ones who, who will be in the final routing path. Uh, there should be one Y node located at the one end of the sequence. There should be a number of Y nodes located at the other end of the sequence. Uh, equal to the total number of X nodes minus one. Mm, yeah. Uh, and uh, one, and then when you have selected this sequence, you should pick one end of it at, uh, at random to be that starting point. That is the one where you start numbering it from one. Let's just rearrange this for the further explanation. After this, uh, the node alpha prepares what we call a, we can call a goodie box f for each of the node. Uh, so he gets a big box and he puts some small boxes in it. Uh, one for each of the nodes and he could also, as you see with a gray, gray box there, put in fake nodes, which we could talk about later or maybe in the Q&A. Uh, so he sends this packet off to the, to the first uh, node in the sequence which will uh, get extract its package from the, from the, from the, pa from the big box. Uh, how he, he, he can be able to, to see which one is his, his is because uh, in the process of selecting these IP addresses, Alpha also uh, re retrieved certain uh, public keys from these uh, nodes from the database. So he will be able to encrypt things to them, encrypt data to them individually. Uh, which and they will try just to decrypt all the all the packs in the big box, and when they get a get a good checksum uh, at one of them, they know it's their own. And uh, as you saw there, there's also the possibility for the for the nodes in this uh, path to to inject uh, fake packets into the box. Every, all uh, according to exact instructions found in their own packet. Uh, uh, which is, of course, from al originating from alpha. 
And uh, one thing that's also in the packet is the IP address of the next node, uh, that is the one that, th that the packet should be sent, per, uh, sent along to, the, the modified packet, and also individual keys to authenticate between, between the next node and himself. So the next node will take his packet and uh, maybe in inject one fake packet, none, no fake packets or many fake packets. And then this procedure will just uh, continue until it has uh, the box ha have traversed the uh, has traversed the entire path and uh, all the nodes have received their own uh, package and which means their own instructions and data which they will extract and, and uh, save. Uh, the the uh, connections, as you see, they will also remain open. And th the important thing is that that uh, the the last node will will send the the uh, box back to alpha, which which means that if 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 anyone had tried to mess with this with this packet. Uh, it would it would not be 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 able since each the each of the nodes authenticate each other no one can can rip the packet out of this uh, path and route it through someone else because no one can see the authentication keys of someone else and they could also not not inject any data because the the checksums are checked uh, at each point and just by receiving the packet again at alpha he knows that that everyone is is uh, playing along and everything went well so then for the second round, he will uh, alpha with, uh, with uh, create another uh, goodie box for each of the, the nodes. S send it uh, along the same connections. This time the data will be signed too because uh, th this time we no, no longer have the, the uh, there no longer is a proof just because the box returns, it's not a proof that, that uh, nothing was tampered with. In the last step, the the IP, uh, the information about where to send it would be would be would be compromised, so it would never return if someone tried to mess with it. Uh, but in this case, the connections are already set up, so the data will be signed by a key or certificate, verifiable by a certificate found in the first round in each each of the boxes. As you see, the the connection to the to the Y node is now disappeared. Uh, disappearing for each uh, for each uh, step that the packet is sent. Uh, and this is because the, this is the last step of, of their uh, participation in this process. As soon as they close, send that packet and close that, that connection, they can forget all about it. And the reason for having these Y nodes at all is that, that uh, an attacker would of course uh, be very interested in having uh, another node controlled by the same attacker uh, adjacent to him in the final routing path. So in the first step where everyone agrees to be part of the node, no one should have the information of who will be the next node in the routing path and be able to, to fake that, that node timed out in order to get a new suggestion of a node and, uh, like that. So that, that's the entire reason for the Y nodes. At this point, the Y nodes are disconnected and at this uh, point when we get to two uh, X nodes, the uh, the X5 node will have received instructions in his new packet about you will get an incoming connection from X3 at this IP and this port and with this key and everything like that. So he will wait for that. The, there will be secure authentication. Uh, and uh, after this point, where the, uh, in the special case node of X3, he will also, if this is an inbound routing path, register the routing path to the network database uh, with a uh, with a specially signed signed the uh, routing routing table entry, which could only be created by Alpha. After doing that, the packet will just uh, continue. All the X nodes will be connected in the same way, disconnecting the Y nodes, which will leave us with uh, uh, the complete routing path, uh, which you will recognize from the previous figures. like this. And now Alpha knows that, that the process is complete. And uh, if it is an inbound uh, routing path, uh, that is a routing path that could receive connections to Alpha, it will also be registered in the, in the, in the global network database routing table. So a little bit just about what's in the goodie box. Uh, you will have, I will have mentioned m many of these things and the routing path construction certificate is the certificate that will be used to sign the data in the second round. 
the IP import of the next and previous nodes. Uh, that, that's to, to make, make it possible for each individual node to authenticate to each other. Random IDs, that's the keys that they identi identify against, against each other with. In addition to, to the IP import, in, uh, if someone could have stolen someone's IP address in, uh, in between. Commu communication certificate of the next and previous nodes. Should be mentioned that all, all connections in the entire protocol are wrapped uh, by SSL, so everything that uh, an external attacker will see is only SSL communication, suggestibly to port 4432 to make it even harder to, to identify that, that what's actually going on and separate it from web traffic, which is of course very possible with, with further analysis, traffic analysis. Some seeds and params for dummy package creation, some seeds and params for stream encryption keys. And these keys will be, w w are the only things in this package with which uh, have not been used at this point. They will be used in the next uh, process of creating routing tunnels. Some flags saying you're an X node, you're a Y node, you're a, this is the first round, this is the second round, and things like that. A, s a secure hash, the entire encrypted setup package, uh, array, the entire outside box containing all the boxes in order to make it impossible for any node to piggyback information on this, uh, in this box, because then, uh, then any node will be able to piggyback encrypted information to any other possible node, non-adjacent node, later in the, in the path, which might be controlled by the same attacker, and then they can c start, an, start an outer channel communication and combine their, their knowledge to, to, to compromise the anonymity. And finally, the, the cryptographic hash, th which makes it possible for, for nodes to, to know which packet is the wrong, the box is the wrong. And in the second round, we also have this, this uh, sound routing table entry for, for that last node. So the routing tunnels, uh, the next step, once you have these routing paths, you would like to communicate with someone. And then we have a process for, for creating routing paths. And the, the main goal of this, with this, uh, with all these things, is of course, why do we make this so messy? Why can't you just uh, have Alpha communicate with each node and say, you're, you're, in, you're in the path here, communicate, connect to him. And why do you have, have this circular, circular thing? Yeah, it's because uh, otherwise the IP address of Alpha w would be, would be could possibly connected to the AP address of it, which is the main goal uh, to, to stop with this protocol. That's why we had this whole circular circular uh, thing uh, with the routing path creation, because uh, it, uh, alpha should never be connecting directly to the endpoint node, because the endpoint node would possibly know the AP address of this path, and that should never be connected to the IP address. So, oh, we we'll now have this path, and we want to create an outbound connection. Uh, to, to a certain AP address. Th this AP address, just like with IP addresses, you have received from, from someone saying, this is the IP address to my server, this is the AP address to my server, so no different from normal internet communication. So, uh, it begins by, by, Alpha begins by sending a notification package through the, through the route path, and he also mm, remembers it. Uh, the next node reads this uh, package, and at this point, it chooses one, one of those stream encryption keys I mentioned in the goodie box, which were the, uh, the only thing not being used at that point. So he, let's say he, he got 100 uh, stream encryption keys. So he does, he, at random, completely random, he, he chooses one of these, and uh, remembers, then encrypts the packet with it, and uh, uh, remembers, okay, this is what the packet looked like when I sent it away, when it was encrypted, and this is the key I used. So the next node does, does the exact thing. It receives a packet, it chooses a key, it encrypts the packet, and it sends it uh, to the next node. So the last node, he gets this, and he also chooses a key, which he remembers, and uh, then he makes a bigger package with, with containing both the package that he received and another package, which we will talk about in a moment. He then creates a completely new TCP connection uh, or to, to the previous node. The other one is not disconnected, it's just grayed out to, to show that it will not be used for this connection anymore. The, the node receives both the packets. He says, ah, this is the, that yellow packet that I sent before, so that must mean it, it will be connected to this key. So I'll remember this key and bind it to, to, to uh, these two connections, the incoming and the outbound, outgoing connection. 
Then I'll encrypt, b decrypt both of the packets uh, uh, with that key. And then of course the, the yellow packet will be decrypted to the, its original form, which was the green packet. And the other one will be decry decrypted to a new form, which we haven't seen before, that is red. Uh, so the next node receives the green, he says, ah, this is the green packet, I recognize that, Let's, it's that key. So I'll create a connection and I'll bind that key to it. And I'll decrypt both packets and then the black packet, of course, reappears and a new packet. Now being decrypted with the keys of every node, the, the turquoise or whatever packet at the, the bottom, and alpha reads both. Now, that the special package at the bottom, which, uh, which uh, the end node sent, is actually, uh, yeah, it's, it's it put uh, together in a special way, practically just repeating the same, the same sequence. The, the meaning with it is to be able to, to make it extremely easy to, to do a brute force success test on it. So alpha will be able to, to brute force and just do a very, very simple test to see was the brute force key guess successful. Uh, and since alpha knows all the, the stream encryption keys uh, of, of the nodes, let's say 100, 100, 100, so 1 million keys, uh, a combination of a million keys, he, will, he can start uh, brute forcing over those keys. Everyone else uh, in the entire internet or world, including the, the, these nodes, they, they won't know any of these stream encryption keys. So if they want to brute force uh, this packet, they will need to brute force the entire, let's say, 128-bit space, which is uh, quite intractable. But alpha will only have to brute force, let's say, a million keys. And the good thing is that since alpha is the, is the, is the node who, ini who initially selected these keys, he he also uh, can can choose the number of keys to to make it uh, exact to t make the brute force time exactly 0 0.1 seconds 0 0.5 seconds on his specific system so that this operation will never take any any uh, unnecessary long time or, or uh, annoyingly long time uh, so let's say one, 0 0.1 second later, he finds that, okay, these are the keys that were randomly selected by each of these nodes. Okay, now, now that I know this, I, I can, uh, Alpha can decrypt or en encrypt messages to the last node, which no one else in between will be able to read, of course, because uh, they only have, have uh, their own keys. So, so one layer of encryption is removed for each step, like, l just like in Tor. And uh, now the anonymous uh, node informs the exit node of the AP address it wants to connect to by creating such an encrypted message. So he's, uh, he encrypts it once, and uh, or, or actually he, he encrypts it with, with all the keys, uh, of course, in the, in the correct order. And each, uh, each node uh, decrypts the packet with their key, which unwraps a layer of uh, encryption, which which results after the last decryption uh, by the last node in a message that he can read. So at this point he knows that, okay, this is an outbound connection. Uh, I'm gonna try to, to, to uh, connect to, the, to that other AP address. So he looks, looks up the AP address in the, in the network database uh, and does all, everything needed necessary for that. He, then he sends just a, a packet containing random data uh, back to the, to the other node, stated so that the anonymized node, so that he will know that it, everything went okay. And at that point, the connection is fully established and uh, at both ends, and the application layer can now start communicating over it, just like a TCP connection. And of course, th this is four rounds, uh, so it will be some delay latency compared to normal TCP uh, connections, or actually uh, quite a bit, but it shouldn't be really much, like creating four, sending, sending a few packets uh, left and forth and uh, back uh, over TCP connections and creating few new TCP connections. It shouldn't be, shouldn't be completely mm, bad. So the inbound uh, route uh, process for creating these nodes, it is done very similarly, uh, which is quite important in, in this aspect. It, it's to the intermediate nodes, all nodes except the terminating node and the anonymized node, uh, it will be completely impossible to know if this is a routing path, a routing tunnel created in an incoming tunnel due to an incoming connection, 
or in an outgoing tunnel uh, uh, due to uh, an outgoing connection being initiated. So if we can just quickly scroll through uh, this. As you can see, the black packet so it comes in a box again, just like the other case, just from the other side. And uh, it's also important that th this is why the, the, that sequence that was chosen while initially creating the routing path, why it must, why the ends of it, you like you have a sequence and then you chose this to be the starting end of the process. Th that is because the intermediate nodes should not be able to conclude which, uh, if it's an outgoing or an, or an incoming routing path at that point either. So at this point they will not know where they are in the chain, the, in, the, in the path, they will not know uh, in which direction the, the anonymized node is and they will not know if they are adjacent to the anonymous, anonymized node or not. Uh, so the, the beta node can immediately use the brute force, so the same brute force uh, method as uh, were used in the initial step. And he then knows the keys, he can create, uh, he can decrypt all data and encrypt all data through the path. So the normal, normal connections are created, sends packets, it's completely symmetrical to, to the, to the uh, last uh, process of creating outbound nodes. But it's very much not uh, equivalent in the anonymized node and in the terminating anonymized, uh, the term terminating intermediate node, but for all the other intermediate nodes it is completely symmetric and uh, impossible to, to separate from each other, the two processes. So at this point, the, the incoming connection can be confirmed uh, to the external peer, that is the, the, the outbound uh, routing path of alpha, so it is. Well, and then it's just confirmed back to the anonymous node that, okay, everything is up and running. You can start sending data and tell the application layer that uh, connection has, an incoming connection has occurred. So it's, the connection is now fully established at both ends and we have a fully anonymized uh, complete connection between alpha and beta which they can start communicating over. But in order to achieve this very important symmetry that we s mentioned previously, you may have noticed that we have only done three passes, three rounds in this process but four in the other one. So we will have to just send a, a fake packet down, uh, down the route be be before the terminating node will start uh, routing any data through the, through the connections. This way the, the, the process is completely symmetrical. Like that. So, uh, now on to some other things. Let's leave the processes. That was the boring, dry, dry part of the, of the, of the presentation, just showing that showing what happens at the protocol level to, to give some kind of idea that this could be done in a completely distributed manner which is actually the entire goal of this project. Not, not to deliver a ready, ready protocol but just to show that yes it could, you can establish connections, you can establish uh, uh, and you can do it quickly, you can do it to see that it's possible to do this in a decentralized way like this. Uh, the end-to-end -end encryption, w once you have that, this, uh, this end-to-end con anonymized connection, you can just uh, perform, for example, double authenticated SSL over it, which will be not that uh, an, a responsibility of the application, but still within the protocol. So, so that is end-to-end -end encryption will be, oh sorry, will be enforced. Uh, yeah, uh, and which also means secure authentication will be will be included with a, with a, a, a PKI structure will actually be 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 Im implied by by this design, which is quite good, uh, useful. Uh, and the used certificates uh, for this SSL can will of course be stored in the network database. In this case, uh, contrary to the other information or certificates which were stored together with the IP addresses, it will be stored together with the AP addresses. So you say, I want to speak to this AP address and you will get some certificates which you can then va verify that you're, you're speaking to the right person. So a little bit more about the IP backward compatibility. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the format and functionality is equivalent, like address format, port semantics, connection semantics, and for, for the very uh, apparent reason of, of being able to, to use previous applications without them knowing about it. So what you do is you, do, you, you, you create binary hooks for, for all common network APIs at the application API level, like the connect API with when the, the, the connect, the close, the bind, uh, all, all app APIs that are used for, for TCP connections. And uh, I'm not sh I, I saw this, this, uh, this previous uh, talk from Roger uh, of the Tor uh, guys who, who said that this was very hard on Windows and not there might be some problems that I have not noticed, but, but, but as far as I know, it's quite, uh, quite easy actually to do it, at least at that level, uh, in a, in a, in a quite stable way actually. Uh, so so th this means you won't need any, any further any assistance from the author of the application. You won't need any source code, and the application won't even know that it's anonymized. It would just think, oh, I'm, sending an I I'm connecting to this IP address, while in reality it's connecting to that AP address. Uh, under some conditions, the, the, this means that the common internet DNS system could even be be used uh, in the cases where the clients don't want to anonymize themselves, but but only the server want to anonymize themselves. Otherwise, you can do the DNS side attack where you have where the where the server has its own DNS server that will identify the users. But and also, it's, it'll be very simple to start supporting things like IPv6 uh, with this design too, because it's not actually. B bound to, to the to the format of the addresses. Once you're inside the the, the network database, they will b just be treated as strings or similar. Uh, so a little bit more about the network database. It contains mainly two separate tables. Uh, one uh, containing information about the IP addresses, the IP address table, with which will have associated information, certificates, and similar to 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 all the IP addresses in the table in, in this network, and then the AP address table, which will contain uh, associated info for all AP addresses in the table. And uh, this will, of course, be completely decoupled, and uh, if they were, would, were to be connected, that would be catastrophe. Um, and this database can be accessed through a very specific strict API, uh, as, f as far as can be enforced, which means that no, no, no database queries, uh, unnecessary database queries will be able to be performed. Like, give me all the IP addresses in the net, or give me all the IP addresses in the net, and things that won't be uh, necessary for the functionality of the protocol. And on top of the DHT, distributed hash table implementation, you, you could add uh, things like voting algorithms, digital signatures, and uh, even enforced entry expiry dates to, to, to make it even more secure and be able to, to enforce uh, permissions and protect from certain kinds of malicious manipulation of this database and the query results. Uh, and uh, the network database sh should also be resilient to net splits, which is practically when, when you have a big cloud uh, of nodes which have a common thing. It's, it's a, an expression quite well known to, to IRC people because then you have several, several servers which, which create one net, and if you cut them, cut, cut them off, you could, you could accomplish funny effects uh, by, by isolating certain parts of the network, which is true here too. So, so you shouldn't be able to do that. And, and the distributed hash table technology actually will, will make that quite hard, and you can make it even harder if you, if you just think about it. Another nice feature to have in, in a protocol like this would be uh, manual override command support, uh, which would be quite a powerful emergency measure uh, to enable to protect against these DOS attacks, which are to be some, somewhat expected. And uh, you can also use it to you can use it to protect from them. You can use it to to restore after some possibly more or less successful DOS attacks. And you could could also use it to protect against uh, malicious nodes that are trying to DOS other nodes or DOS, DOS the network. So the way it's used is that you can send uh, you can send signed commands to to some kind of central authority like. S Persons uh, known known by the maintainers of the open source project, or certain people who are trusted by, by the main maintainers, could have these keys. No one would have, no, no one would be able to to would have to know that that they who has these keys. Uh, they they just have them, and it will work anyway. So so these trusted people would would be able to sign commands and flood them all over the network uh, through this 
uh, distributed hash table uh, implementation. Most hash distributed hash table implementations actually natively support uh, such a functionality to efficiently flood uh, certain commands to, to all the nodes in the network without any duplicate traffic. And uh, yeah, and, and the verification certificate, that is the public key used to, to verify these commands, will of course be hard coded into the source code of the clients. So, so if you send a non-signed command, it will not be flooded any further than the exact node you send it to, which will prevent DOS attacks, flooding DOS attacks of this kind. And also, of course, sending, uh, sending arbitrary commands which to, to, to destroy the network. Uh, these commands will, of course, not be commands for executing commands on the computers of the clients, only commands for operating on the network, uh, the anonymous network, like uh, banning certain IP addresses who are trying to, to do bad things or uh, manually editing the network database if someone has inserted malicious contents into it. Uh, but not, never anything affecting client computers. And, and there's also no real worry uh, even if the keys uh, of uh, the signing keys would leak because you can just uh, release version 1.01 .01 and then th it will have new signing keys and perhaps the, the persons who's, who were able to crack the keys could, yeah, they could start, they could ban some, some people from the network for the limited hours that, that uh, before the new client came out but it could be easily restored, so no worry. And uh, this is just a, 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 a schematic of, a, of an example of, of a high availability routing path design because uh, some people who, who see these routing paths, they, they, they would, would say like, but, but oh, if only one node in this, in this uh, path would disconnect, which is of course quite possible and quite uh, common in a, in a completely decentralized protocol. Uh, then the entire connection would break. So, but there there are uh, ways to to create high availability routing paths while still uh, still keeping all these important properties of of, of uh, routing paths and uh, routing tunnels that we have discussed. It's actually not as easy as could be thought at first sight, as could be probably seen at this uh, picture. But but it it could be done, and uh, and uh, we have thought about a design for it. And this is a schematic of one of these designs. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's symmetric with two ends, and that's because of one of these problems of keeping the, the, the property of no intermediate node being able to tell if it's adjacent to the anonymized node or at all where it is. And the nodes that actually uh, who are adjacent to, to the anonymized node, uh, it will be very hard to make, to make a design that would make them not able to derive anything of, of such sorts if you not if you don't make it to split to symmetric like this there are probably possibly other ways too but but there, there's quite quite a problem to to do so anyway we found so a little bit uh, of the aftermath uh, of the the implications of this uh, such a protocol legally legal aspects and implications we have one, one example where where uh, Private organizations go after go after users uh, very very aggressively today. So it's it's a, it's a good example of anyone who would uh, try to to bring down the system legally. And it's the file sharing example, of course. So today you they bring uh, br lawsuits are being brought against uh, people just uh, on the basis of them connecting to a certain torrent, for example, because that torrent uh, contains something that they don't want people to share and think it's illegal to share. Uh, so th that's the state today. So, but if you use this uh, protocol, mm, or they will probably want to, to come to this level of, of uh, people that you can sue people for only using a file sharing protocol because they think it, it could, could only be used for illegal means anyway, which is of course not true. Uh, but th Using the, uh, a protocol like this will, of course, uh, prevent that because uh, you will never be able to see that, that a certain person is using, using uh, whatever protocol they are using inside the anonymization protocol because it's all tunneled inside. Uh, so then uh, they will probably try to, to bring lawsuits against the endpoints uh, in the anonymization network. Like if they connect to, to one of these torrents, you 
the method used today is that, that if you want to find out who's using a torrent, you can connect to it and then you will get a list of IP addresses uh, who, of uh, nodes being a member of that torrent and then you can start suing them. But, but in, in this case, these IP addresses that would be seen would only be the exit nodes of, of the, the uh, random routing paths created. And these exit nodes would of course have nothing to do wi with, with, uh, with the, the concept of file sharing, this particular case of file sharing, and they won't even have uh, any access at all to the contents of the, the shared data. Uh, so that will make it quite a lot harder to at least to, 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 to be able to, to successfully sue them. And uh, you could also compare it to somehow to, to the routers of the internet. Routers on the internet who, who, who route uh, encrypted data are very much similar to, to nodes in, such in a network like this. They are just there to, to help uh, people communicate generically. And they could happen to, to, to send uh, illegal data through them. Uh, while at the same time not being able to access it if it's encrypted. So th that shows uh, a little bit that it probably would be a bit harder to, to sue these nodes. So then the next step that, that uh, these organizations would probably like to do is to sue, sue uh, people just on the basis of them using a certain anonymization protocol because this anonymization protocol in turn could be used to use other protocols, which in turn could be used to do illegal stuff. Uh, so uh, as you can hear, it's, it's, it will be a bit hard, but with enough lobbying, I guess you can do anything. And that's why, why you would like to, to, to hide the fact that you hide, uh, prevent protocol identification, which as previously mentioned, was one of the design goals of this protocol. So it should make it harder to do that too. Then I guess the only things that you could resort to is laws to, to be able want to sue people who use cryptography because cryptography can can be used to, to to use protocols which can be used to use protocols which could be used to do bad things and yeah it could could be done I think I think France once had a ban on cryptography I'm not sure if it's still like that cryptography where the government didn't have the some secret keys that they could decrypt it with but it could happen it will happen but but I think it would be it's increasingly harder today to say something like that, that create a ban on cryptography. I don't think it'll be hard. And the next step, the final step, if that won't work, is of course to want to, to ban people, sue people for, for using the internet, I guess. But that's probably will be quite hard too. So, so on top of these, uh, these technical things uh, to, to which are made to, to prevent all these forces who want, would want to, to shut down a protocol like this uh, and sue the users of it. Uh, I also thought some about uh, license, some license trickery that could possibly be, be done with, with a protocol like this. Uh, and my ID, which I'm not sure would be, would be, would be <laughs> viable or efficient in any way, but, but, but I have some indications that, that, that it could have some of the intended effects. Uh, you have a license on the main specification saying that uh, uh, a certain end user license agreement, a EULA, uh, must accompany all implementations of the protocol. So th that's, that's the license you put on the, the main specification or the, the, the uh, reference imp implementation of it or whatever, in, in addition to the normal open source, uh, open source uh, license. You add this little clause. And uh, so this will make it illegal to, to, to create any, to compile, create, or, or base any implementation of this uh, protocol uh, without including this end user license agreement with each implementation. This uh, end user license agreement in turn would say that, yeah, that through using the, 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 the certain Im the implementation in question, uh, the user would understand and agree that no node in the anonymous network uh, can or should be held responsible for any data being routed through it uh, due to the simple fact that the, the user neither has control over it, what it may contain, nor, nor any possibility whatsoever to access the data itself. And this is not like, I agree, I th it's not as much as them promising that they, that they cannot sue them. It, it's accepting that they, uh, they have been informed of this fact so that it could not be stated later that anything else. Uh, but, but and the second part is uh, which could be could be phrased in, in different different matters, but uh, different ways uh, would say th say that uh, the user of this implementation would will agree to not use the implementation to gather 
data that could be used uh, in filing a lawsuit or actually to uh, in a better formulation would be to, to, to use it to extract and in any way save, uh, store IP address information of the, of the clients using this protocol uh, period. Uh, so th this would have a little uh, interesting uh, effect that if some, some of these organizations wanting to sue people w would, would like to, to harvest uh, uh, IP addresses uh, of, of uh, l let's say the file sharing example again with, with, a, with a torrent, they would have to use some kind of implementation of this, this protocol uh, in the first place to be able to just connect to this torrent because it's a completely separate network from the internet. Uh, and uh, next, uh, they would would uh, start harvesting the, the IP addresses of the uh, adjacent of the nodes of the last nodes of the routing paths. But if they do that, they will have broken the end user license agreement. And uh, normally, these this kind of organizations are their main goal is to to go after people who break end user license agreements or break, break intellectual pro property rights. So it would become quite an ironic situation which would be quite, quite annoying to, to, to them at least. Uh, and uh, okay, so if then they say, okay, we make our own implementation of this protocol and make our own client. Well, if you don't you inc uh, include the end user license agreement in this impl implementation, you will have broken the license of the protocol and again, you have broken intellectual property rights and you're, you're there at this uh, ironic situation again. So. Uh, it could be quite mm, funny and somewhat efficient, uh, but but of course you would probably not be able to go go all the way to court and prevent some of the, some of its users to be be if someone tries to to sue them uh, they could probably sue them anyway and but but this will probably make it harder at least for them to 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 not look like hypocrites uh, and uh, this would could affect the, the the lawsuits and not to mention their their, their interest in doing such a thing. So uh, we're starting to, 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 to come near the end. Uh, not quite yet though, but, but uh, l let's uh, review the design goals that we set up in the st at start and see what, see if uh, this implementation that I've been, design and implementation that I've been speaking about for a while now, if how well it fits these design goals. So design goal number one, the complete decentralization part. Uh, the protocol has no central points uh, or even nodes that are individually more valuable to the collective function of the anonymous network than any other. So if you attack one node, you bring down that node. And it's the same thing that if that node would just disconnect his computer and go to bed. So, so which would, will be quite common, I guess. So, so no worries there. And uh, there are no single points uh, of the network to attack, no server, no anything, and you no one to sue who runs a server or anything because there are no central servers. So I guess we could say that this design goal is uh, pretty much uh, accomplished. Design goal number two, maximum dust resistance. Uh, well, dust resistance has at least been a concern during the entire design process, and it should be continue to be a concern when this project is uh, this protocol is further developed and Im implemented in the end, for hopefully, and uh, th that should limit the attack vector substantially. It could, of course, always be improved. So, so that's the entire reason for having a, a project like this. With many, it will need many knowledgeable people who will be able to to do input, uh, give input, uh, and uh, it must be continue to be a constant area of concern and improvement. But y I guess you could say that this far, it's sort of as far as we know covered. Uh, so uh, review of the third design goal, theoretically secure anonymization. Well, all involved risk probabilities can be expressed in terms of known probabilities uh, with the current design. All security is based on cryptography and randomness uh, and it could uh, thus be, be, be uh, explained with crypto, cr defined with cryptographic proofs. Uh, no obscurity parts, n nothing is based on obscurity. And hopefully no gaping holes have been left to, to chance or, or that s some of you will, will be able to, to tell me right after this presentation. Uh, but, but review and impro improvements are of course always needed. Uh, and uh, uh, the good thing is that the similarities with, for example, the Tor uh, protocol will be able to, to make use of many of the valuable uh, experiences uh, that they have, uh, that they have uh, lived through the years. Uh, like, the, for example, those that uh, Roger mentioned uh, in his previous uh, talk in this room. So I guess we can say that that one's 
covered so far. Uh, then the, the cycle number four, theoretically secure end-to-end -end, uh, anon encryption. Mm, well, all data is encrypted in multiple layers. Well-known and trusted algorithms should be able to, to it, it should provide end-to-end -end encryption. And since all connections are wrapped by SSL, which is very well-known and well-used, well the protection from external eavesdroppers should, uh, under all circumstances, be at least uh, that of uh, equivalent of that of SSL, which is mm, quite okay. So we, we can consider that one accomplished too. Uh, this angle number five, isolation from the normal internet. Uh, well, it's, it is impossible to contact and communicate with any regular IP address. You can't just say, I want to uh, speak to this IP address because there's no way to, 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 to tell the protocol that, tell the client that. You, you, you won't reach it. You, it only understands AP addresses. So, so oh, that's impossible, and uh, therefore the network uh, can't be used to, to anonymously commit illegal acts against any computer that has not itself joined the network and exposed certain services to it and accepted the risks of allowing anonymous communication with these services. So we can consider that one comes to, I guess. Uh, this angle number six, protection against protocol identification. Yeah, well, SSL connections are used as an external shell for all connections used by the protocol. And uh, suggestively, they would also all use the standard port, default uh, standard port of the S standard web s server SSL port, TCP443, which would m not, at least not make it, uh, make it uh, really simple to, to just uh, filter on, on the, oh, SSL on this and that port, and because it would be this SSL and it would be the same SSL port as normal web connections. Uh, but of course, the, you, could, the, you could practically always, uh, with enough advanced traffic analysis methods, identify uh, certain kinds of traffic, or at least distinguish certain kinds of traffic from, from uh, other certain kinds of traffic, which in this case would be normal SSL uh, web connections. But the goal is to make it hard enough, So, because if it's hard enough, it will take up too much resources, and uh, most of all, uh, produce too many false positives to be to be practically or uh, commercially viable. Because if you have just, let's say, a few percent of, of false positives in a blocking SSL connections uh, from an ISP, that the users of that ISP would not be very happy that every every one or two connections in a hundred are blocked right away from from the when they are surfing to their bank. So that's good. So I guess we could say that we're well on the way with that one too. Uh, this angle number seven, high volume and throughput capacity, and this is uh, quite interesting one, uh, because uh, s due to the, the previously uh, mentioned factors or facts that there are, there is no practical way for a node to know if it's uh, communicating directly with a certain uh, node or if it's talking with the terminating intermediate node of, of a routing path owned by by a s an anonymized node. It actually means that. Alpha could talk directly to beta and still have ha, have a reasonable doubt a reasonable doubt about who who's, who who they are actually talking to. So in many cases, you can use extremely short or no uh, routing paths at all. Uh, so direct peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication, and yes, the IP address would be exposed, and in certain under certain conditions, this would this would not be good at all. But under under other certain conditions, this would this would not really matter, since since uh, reasonable doubt would would be uh, the goal in some way. So th that would of course uh, result in, in very high transfer speeds in, in those locations that you could connect uh, directly directly between nodes, because it would be like except for the for the multiple layers of encryption, which will be handled uh, just fine by the hundreds of uh, c uh, processor cores that will be in everyone's computer during the coming years, uh, there will be really fast communication. Uh, yeah. So we could uh, we consider that one accomplished too in some way. Then the last one, well, the, the protocol uh, supports arbitrary network communication, so it's generic. The protocol design has been ex has been uh, abstracted in a way that each individual level of the protocol can be exchanged and redesigned without the other parts being affected. Well, just abstracted. And uh, finally, the backward compatible. Yeah, the protocol does emulate and hook all TCP network APIs and can thus be, be externally applied to any application that, that uses normal TCP communication. And it could be anonymized without, without it itself even knowing. So we can consider that one done too. Now, finally, now even <laughs> closer to the end, uh, a little comparison with, with other anonymization solutions. 
just to, to see see the s some certain differences. And of course, this first one is a bit bit, bit provoke provocative, uh, pro provocative, yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, Tor is very very good protocol. Uh, but but as mentioned, it it lacks some of the design goals that this one has, which. And these design goals are uh, much important to to many 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 anonymization applications that people would do, would use this protocol for. So this one is designed from the ground up with the current and future uh, practical anonymization needs and demand in mind. Uh, it is computable w com compatible with all existing and future network enabled software uh, without any need for adaptions or upgrades. And yes, there are some, uh, as Roger mentioned, some uh, tools to do that for Tor, but 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 on. As he also mentioned, no, no, no good such tools for for Windows, and also it's 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 uh, it's some kind of ad hoc thing that was not uh, that was not uh, in the real protocol specification. Uh, we have higher throughput. With throughput is, is uh, big problem um, through through the things I just mentioned with the short routing paths. With the long routing paths, of course, you don't have the high throughput, but 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 mm, yeah, w we have the possibility for it with with reasonable doubt. Uh, no traffic volume limits, which it's which is quite very very important in Tor. It, it said you, you you shouldn't transfer large volumes. You will be kicked. You you will be breaking the rules. So people can't watch their YouTube and whatever they would like to use high traffic volume for. Uh, it's isolated from the normal internet, the Phantom protocol, which is also that's also one of the very important points because. Uh, no, no one would like to, to run a distributed protocol uh, where they are automatically an exit node, uh, uh, out proxy, if they feel like uh, I could be, my door could be kicked in by the FBI any day because the, the NASA was hacked from my computer. That's not a good thing. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, fa with Phantom, that's, that can happen. With Tor, that can happen. Uh, you have end-to-end -end encryption, uh, enforced end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, so, so, so even if uh, sure uh, users should know themselves that Tor is not a safe uh, to use unencrypted, and uh, uh, and that application developers, yeah, they should always use use uh, encrypted protocols. But 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 what it really means is that if I'm not completely sure of, of the details of all the applications I'm using, are they using cryptography? Are they using secure cryptography? Are they then I won't I won't dare use using them over Tor anyway. So, so, but in this case, it, it is uh, built into the protocol, secure end-to-end -end encryption, so you will never have to worry. Just run your applications as usual and it'll be fine, hopefully. Uh, uh, yeah, and also DNS leak is, 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 a, is a vulnerability uh, that has been, been argued against Tor previously, but Roger mentioned it too that 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 some applications can be provoked to, to do DNS lookups and then you can sit there and catch them and uh, connect. The, but in this case, since we are already hooking all networks ap network APIs, the the application can't do anything how much ever it wants to, um, and uh, so we're, we're blocked that. And uh, the last point I'm not sure of at all. Uh, so so uh, perhaps perhaps not. Uh, it better prevents positive protocol identification, but I know Tor has put uh, some work into that, so the last point could be completely false. So j just another uh, relatively well-known anonymization protocol, not at all as known as uh, Tor, but but within the world of uh, uh, internet anonymization, it's it at least it is at least a little known. It's called I2P, and it's actually quite good. In many ways, and very in many ways, very very similar to, to Phantom, uh, but still some differences. Uh, uh, Phantom is compatible with with uh, with all these uh, existing products, while in I2P uh, you have to practically recompile and redesign every product that should be used with it, which which reduces its usability to nothing for normal users. They have one one uh, I think it's a client for for blogging, one for for, for quite limited uh, product for for using BitTorrent and um, yeah it, that that will 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 hold adoption beyond any useful levels which in turn would will, will reduce keep speed and security down which which will uh, be very bad for the protocol uh, they also they also don't have end to end encryption after a certain version they had it at first but then they removed it i'm not sure at all why they did that but that's the way it is uh, and uh, it 
uh, the, the last point item is just as uh, with Tor. I'm not sure about that one because I haven't been able to, to dig up enough technical information about their communication, low-level communication protocol, but it might, might be a case, might, might be the case, might not be. And finally, uh, a comparison wi with other anonymization solutions uh, is the comparison with, with specific programs. For example, anonymized P2P. You have a, a client that does a certain thing like IRC, f file sharing, and, you s and then you build anonymization into this one. Uh, and uh, I can't say anything specific about, b about the uh, technical points of that one, of course, because there's no specific application here, but it could very well have, have the weaknesses of the, of the other uh, things that I mentioned in the previous slides here with Tor and I2P, but I can't say anything because we're not talking about a specific application. But uh, there would probably be less work and less interest in such a product than a generic uh, anonymization product, which would, which would mean less, less resources put into making it safe. So, so, so that's for, for the technical part. But uh, it, such a product would also, Phantom would also be less likely for a general ban, like uh, if a certain organizations w w would, would uh, lobby for, no, oh, this product should be, this protocol, this product should be illegal because it could only be used, it is only used, it could only be used to, to share files illegally. Why would a file sharing application want to be anon anonymous? It's only to break the law. So, so then maybe you could make it illegal completely, but with, with a generic uh, anonymization protocol, you, you can't say that because it can be used for lots of good stuff and it will be used for lots of good, good uh, legal uh, things. Uh, so, so that's one, one uh, advantage. And uh, also uh, the generic nature o o of a ge generic protocol opens it up, of course, infinitely much more potential than just binding the anonymization to, to, to certain activity. Now we're really uh, closing in uh, to the end and uh, I'm just gonna list a few known weaknesses just to, to be able to, to, to for everyone to know and, and uh, think about. So if all the nodes in a routing path are being controlled by the same attacker, this, this attacker can, can, can uh, bind, connect, he can connect the anonymized node to the, to the entry or exit node, and that would of course connect the IP address with the AP address, which would compromise the an anonymity. Uh, and that's not good. That compromises the entire me meaning for the protocol. Uh, but again, no data can still be eavesdropped, no matter if you control every node and uh, every network link in the entire system. Uh, yeah, so, and so you can only conclude which, uh, which uh, AP address is, uh, that route is talking to, not, not uh, what, what IP address is on the other end, because this is only a single routing path. Uh, and again, it's very important to, to note that, that an attacker uh, who controls, say, three nodes in a routing path, he will never be able to, to, to know that, okay, are these three nodes, do they constitute the entire routing path? Or is the last node that the last compromised node is speaking to actually yet another intermediate routing path, uh, rou intermediate node, routing node, which makes, makes it very hard to, to, to use, even if you would control the entire path. You wouldn't know if you, if you are controlling the entire path, which would make you unable to act on, such on the, uh, that information in many ways. Uh, and again, the algorithms for, for, for the node selection of the routing paths uh, are, are uh, first, they are controlled by the, by the nodes themselves, uh, the, the ones that are, the nodes that are protected by that actual routing path. So they can select uh, the, uh, the, the trade-off between, between uh, efficiency and security by themselves. And also, you can use, optimi optimize the algorithms for that to like never use any, which Roger also mentioned, like never use any, any nodes in the same C network, B net, A net, uh, ISP, country, whatever. Two, uh, the second weakness. If an attacker uh, monitors the traffic of all nodes in the network, uh, th that attacker will be able to conclude the same thing as in the previous weakness, uh, the, well, the first one, uh, without even having to doubt uh, where the routing path ends. Because uh, in that case, he, he would be able to, to, to correlate th that, okay, traffic enters here, traffic enters, goes out there, enters there, goes out there, and there, the, it isn't any traffic going out there. So th then you can, at a much uh, higher uh, probability, conclude that, that the routing path ends there. 
but this uh, was, uh, as you know, what I stated as a limitation of the protocol from the start, and this situation isn't, at least at this point, very very likely. Sure, there are some some countries with data retention uh, uh, the, and everything today, and big big three letter uh, three letter organizations uh, doing lots of uh, white tapping. But there are also a lot of countries who who would not want to cooperate with with those agencies uh, at this point. So if you just bounce it uh, between a few countries uh, or just have one node in such a country, then it would be would be uh, more secure. Uh, and uh, some anonymization protocols try to counter th this kind of attack, even this kind of attack, uh, by delaying data that each node receives and by, by sending out junk data. Uh, but uh, since uh, this goes against the, the high throughput design goal of a phantom, we, we won't do that. And we, we really, for most applications, we won't need that kind of security either. So, so uh, yeah. The third and last weakness, uh, individual uh, intermediate nodes in a routing path uh, could try to, what they would want is to, to find another compromised uh, uh, intermediate node further down the routing, routing path, even though it is not adjacent to that one. But, but with the current design and what our goal is, is that if two compromised nodes in a path are not adjacent, they should not be able to conclude in any way that they are in the same routing path and, and thus uh, co be able to correlate their, their knowledge. Uh, but so what could they do about that? Yeah, they could, they could try to, to use some kind of covert channels to communicate this information and probably they would like to communicate the 31, 32 bits that constitute their IP address because after that has been communicated, they could of course create, create separate channels and co communicate whatever information they want to. Uh, so what could such covert channels be? Yeah, it could be timing of the data that is routed through the path, like make some small delays and, and encode information into these details, or, or uh, even more likely and more efficient, uh, uh, encode information into the chunk size of the communicated data, like they receive 20 bytes, then they send three, then two, then one, and, and uh, with very s small delay, and, and uh, only for until they have communicated this data. So this is quite a possible attack actually, which could be countered uh, to some degree in some ways with splitting up uh, and merging data, but it's quite hard to do it in any really, really good way without compromising the high volume, uh, high, high uh, transfer rate uh, design goal. So th th that's probably the biggest problem that should be thought about more. Uh, but again, if they manage to cooperate, to, 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 to communicate they will not be able to know if they are at the end of the node, at the route path, uh, adjacent to the anonymized node, which would uh, luckily heavily reduce the, the usefulness of such an attack. So, uh, just to, to sum, sum things up, the, the, what was the current state of the project? Well, there is a white paper which contains this information and, and uh, quite a lot more details. Uh, so, this is what I have been described, uh, bes describing and what, what the paper contains is an initial suggestion, uh, an example for, for requirements and design of, of such a next uh, generation anonymization protocol. But, but again, it's not a complete specification ready for immediate implementation, uh, but although it is quite detailed and comprehensive, so it is more or less a full example of, of how, how you could do it just to prove that it could be done, it should be worked on more. This presentation, if you want to see all the fancy animations which, which would perhaps uh, help, uh, help get a faster overview of the communication process, you could download it too. And uh, there's also, a, I've uh, created a Google code project which contains a, a code trunk without any code yet, a uh, discussion group where you can discuss <laughs> stuff, and uh, a wiki where, where you could uh, store and publish the, the, the results of these discussions, I guess. And also a blog where, where interested people could, could follow the prog progress of the pro project. So the final summary. Uh, the internet and its users uh, are in increasingly bigger need of a good anonymization solution which, which meets the requirements of today and beyond, not just the, the lo low, la low uh, volume communications and other limitations of the current protocols. Uh, at least in order for, for this protocol or such a protocol to become some kind of de facto standard for easy, anonymi easy and secure uh, anonymization that, that many people would use. 
so far, the Phantom Protocol has, has had uh, the main goals of exploring the, the optimal requirements for, for such an anonymi anonymization solution, providing uh, examples of solutions for, for all the problems that, that would reasonably possibly be, be related to, to this kind of project. And uh, uh, it also has the goal of inspiring discussions uh, of the design of such a system, which we will prob hopefully hear more about uh, at this conference. You are very welcome to, 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 to contact me for, for more uh, questions, discussions, uh, and anything. Uh, and I would really like to, to, to speak more to the, to, the, to the maintainers and developers of the, of the current projects like Tor and I2P because I'm sure there are lots and lots of things that could be, could be done collaboratively and uh, much to be won there. So, so please contact me, any Tor uh, or I2P people here. Uh, and um, yeah, and the final goal is to, to be somehow the, the starting starting point and central point for the emergence of such an open de facto standard for free, secure, and ubiquitous internet anonymization. So the next phase, what would that be? Yeah, to would be to probably to discuss uh, discuss the problems and uh, and uh, in the end stipulate a final final uh, 1.0 uh, protocol specification. Start start to implement it. Uh, that phase, uh, uh, th that phase, both with the implementation and the design, we will need the, the help and collaboration of many knowledgeable uh, people and dedicated people. So again, if you if you feel like this is interesting, please contact me or please join the join on the project uh, project site, which is at this URL. So now we can have the Q and A, and I guess we will be moving to another room for that. I think. So that's all for now, and you have my email address here.